Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much. I mean, that's the first double introduction I've ever witnessed, much less received. Um, that was great. Thank you, Chris um, and Heather. So uh, I was, I thought Chuck, when he was talking today about kind of that terror that comes with the blank page and sort of the, the pressure that we put ourselves through as writers when we sit down to write, um, I was thinking about that today as I got this story idea from this morning session and I ran upstairs to my room in the Marriott to jot it down before I forgot it. Those of you who are staying in the Marriott, have, have you guys seen these notepads? <laughs> At the very top, uh, this is a piece of scratch paper. At the very top of it, it says, leave a trail of genius. <laughs> this is like the most intimidating notepad <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, so no thanks Marriott Corporation. I forgot the idea. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm here today on kind of a strange mission, which is uh, I'm going to try to convince every single person in this room to do National Novel Writing Month in November. Um, yeah, yeah. So let me start, just to see how much work I have ahead of me, can I see a show of hands of those of you who are already planning on writing a 50,000 word novel in November? Okay, leave those hands up. Oh, okay. All right, I'd hope that. All right, we got this. We're gonna do this, okay. So, uh, and again, sorry, how many of you guys have participated in the past, just to get a sense of it? Okay, so a fair amount. So for those of you who are kind of like, nano he, what? And National Novel Writing Month, it's, it's basically based on this somewhat ridiculous idea that everybody in the world should spend November writing a 50,000 word book from scratch. And the way it works is you sign up on our website, and we're free, we're a nonprofit. You, you create a, kind of an author profile. You can list your favorite authors. If you have any friends that you've talked into doing it with you, you can list them, at them as your writing buddies. And once you sign up, you start getting notifications of local events that are happening. And this was always really important that there be this kind of website that everybody can come and get inspired and encouraged. But there's also this real world offline component. So in towns like Macon, from, you know, from here to Paris to Manitoba, the Bay Area, pretty much most nights of the week in November, in about 500 cities and towns around the world, there is a, a public, open, welcoming write-in going on, where you bring your laptop or notebook, legal pad, whatever, and you just sit down with strangers and write. Um, you write offline, so you're actually writing your novel on your own whatever, laptop, computer. Um, but then you update your word count on our website. And when you start updating your word count, you get this very satisfying, kind of magical progress bar that kind of grows. And each day, you're encouraged to write 1,667 words. And that number really becomes like a force. It's sort of like emblazoned on your forehead throughout the month of November. So you're, you're writing. You're getting this cool stats graph. You can kind of see how, much, how far you've come on this, how much you have left to write. And Throughout the month, we email out pep talks as well, kind of encouraging, don't stop writing, missives. Uh, the staff write some. We get great writers like Philip Pullman and Neil Gaiman, uh, Sue Grafton, Dave Eggers, really great, talented authors who are also lending their voice to this idea that your books are really important and that you should write them. And the interesting thing about National Novel Writing Month is that the novel part is a little bit of a misnomer. That in November, we get people who are writing all sorts of things that are not novels, and that's great. We really believe that this is really an event dedicated to encouraging writing. So we have people that are also writing memoirs in November. We have people who are writing uh, PhD dissertations in November, uh, epic poems, um, screenplays. And whatever you're writing in National Novel Writing Month, you write and you write, and at the end of the month, if you have written 50,000 words, if you've crossed this official threshold into noveldom, you upload a version of your manuscript to our website where it is counted by a computer script. And if you have, in fact, crossed this 50,000 word goal line, then you get, for all of your work, all of your stress, all of that ignoring of your family that you've done, uh, you get a PDF of a winner's certificate that you have to download yourself <laughs> print out, and write your own name on with a pen. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. You also get some web badges. And the, I, 
the biggest prize really is the manuscript itself, obviously, and the kind of the experience of spending a month running amok in your own imagination. And this idea started really small. As Heather was saying, it was back in 1999. I invited a group of friends to write a novel in a month with me. 20 of us signed on for that, that first year. Um, and none of us had really tried to write a novel before. I mean, we loved reading. We revered authors. But as writers, we were just completely clueless. And when the month began, a, a group of us, mostly out of craven fear, uh, began getting together each night after work to write. And um, week one came and went, and, and week two came and went. And around week three, something kind of interesting started happening, which was these books, which we had started unencumbered with things like um, plots, <laughs> characters, uh, or credible storytelling ability of really any sort, started to come alive. And that moment when the electricity flows through a writing project for the first time, I mean, we've all felt that. I mean, it's electrifying. It really feels like nothing else. And we were all really freaked out. Because I think all of us had this sense that novels were written by this superhuman species called a novelist, right? But here we were. We were writing, and these books were having a life of their own. These characters were, were quitting jobs that we had taken a long time to get for them, and now they're dating woefully inappropriate people. And it, <laughs> and it was great. And by the end of the month, the six of us who had gotten together every night and written all crossed this 50,000 word finish line. And these were really not great books, okay? I think, I think the industry term for what we wrote is bad books. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that we had started the month with nothing and that we had ended it 30 days later with the first draft of a, you know, a reasonably unhorrible novel it changed the way I saw my potential, and it changed the way I saw the potential of everyone around me. Because I knew that if, if we could do it, anybody could do it. And that first NaNoWriMo was when I saw that, in fact, novels aren't written by novelists. That novels are written by everyday people who give themselves permission to write novels. And nothing was the same for me after that. And what had started as this kind of over-caffeinated dare had become one of the most interesting, important things I'd done in my life. So that was 1999. And the next year, I sent out the email to the same friends, and they forwarded it to friends. And there was an actual website. And we grew from, I think, from 21 people to about 140 people. The next year, it grew to 5,000 people. The next year, it grew to 40,000. And last NaNoWriMo, which was the 13th, we had 250,000 adults taking part from 37 countries. Uh, in one month, National Novel Writing Month participants wrote three billion words of fiction. Over the years, we've launched some kind of unexpected novel writing careers. I think at this point, we've had about 115 people sell their NaNoWriMo manuscripts to traditional publishers. Uh, we've had four New York Times bestsellers start as National Novel Writing Month manuscripts. Last year, I had that surreal moment of going and watching a Hollywood movie that was based on a NaNoWriMo novel, <laughs> which was uh, that uh, Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen. Yeah, amazing. Like, in there, in the theater, and there is Reese Witherspoon and the vampire from Twilight, and, <laughs> and they're, like, saying NaNoWriMo words. It was incredible. Um, and so I turned National Novel Writing Month into a nonprofit about six years ago. And we now have a full-time staff of seven with an office in Berkeley. Heather's here in Macon. Um, we have summer programs. And then we also have the Young Writers Program that Chris had mentioned. And we send free creative writing curriculum, workbooks, stickers, buttons to classrooms. Last year, we had 2,000 classrooms that took these free resources. And 80,000 kids and teens wrote their first books with us. And getting to be involved in this for the past 13 years has been one of the most wonderful, unexpected careers 
And I never dreamed it would get this big. And this January, I did the hardest thing that I've ever done. And I packed up my desk, and I turned in my keys, and I left the organization in absolutely amazing hands, and I set off to be a full-time writer. Yeah. I love it. That's not really an applause line at non-writers conference events. That's it's only thank you. Yeah, yeah. So how many of you guys have left jobs so you have more time to write? How many of you left? Yeah, yeah. It feels great when you decide to do it and, and then you do it because it's like, here we are, we're unchained, you know, because we have all these ideas, you know, it's kind of like, you know, no more having to get up at 5 a.m. to sneak in that writing time, you know, no more meetings, no more spreadsheets, you know, no more of these steady paychecks to hold us back from where we, <laughs> our true potential as human beings. And it has been a really adventure-filled, educational, interesting, fantastic nine months. Um, and I've had moments where I have felt absolutely on top of the world. And I have had a lot of moments where I have wondered what the hell I have done. Um, but in these moments of doubt, I think back to this great old quote from John Shedd. And he said, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And I've spent the last 13 years of National Novel Writing Month watching thousands of people get inspired by their books and decide to make writing a more central part of their life, which means that they're guiding their ships out into the harbor, out from the harbor into the open ocean. And and I've been monitoring their progress from shore. You know, I've been watching them through the binoculars, been taking notes on how, how it goes for them. And a lot of them have found great treasure. Um, some of them have been beset with maybe more scurvy than you would like to hear about. <laughs> but the one thing that they all shared before they set out was this drive to write. You know, they heard this clear, mysterious, sometimes maddening call to tackle these huge creative challenges, to sail out, to meet that adventure on the horizon. And, and the fact that we are all here today means we also have heard that call. And from watching all of these riderly ships set sail over the years, I've seen that the most successful of them have had that call, but they've also remembered to pack four important things. And when I set out on my journey, I stuffed those things in a waterproof bag, and they have been very useful to me. And I thought it might be interesting for me to share them here today with you guys as well. So the first thing is a deadline. Oh, what a surprise, Chris Beatty talking about deadlines. Um, to me, having a great deadline for your book project is more important than having a good idea for your book project. And it sounds kind of stupid, I know, but it's true. And it's true because the human imagination is one of the most formidable engines on Earth. And given the right amount of prodding, it will take this rough, flawed, kind of half-assed concept and turn it into something dazzling. But sadly, the human imagination, when left completely to its own devices, will happily spend its entire life eating Cheetos and watching TV on the couch. <laughs> I mean, you have to poke it to get it moving, to keep it on track. And this is where a deadline works miracles, because deadlines force us to decide and declare where we're going. Deadlines are basically a pin in the map. And they transform this behemoth, sprawling, multi-year task of writing a book into a series of kind of small, manageable steps. Now, the tough thing about deadlines, as we all know, is that we tend to accumulate a lot of them in the parts of our lives where we want them the least, like work and school. And the places where we need them the most, these kind of optional, challenging, creative endeavors that we're probably not getting paid for right away, those are the places that it's hardest to find a good deadline. And this is where the deck is stacked 
towards established writers who are under contract with traditional publishers. Because those people are in the blessed position of angering entire departments at their publishers if they turn in their stuff late. They also have advances that they'd have to return, agents that might possibly disown them. Um, now, until you and I get the power to harness the potential of angering large groups of strangers, the question is, how do we create these scary, motivating deadlines that our imaginations need to do their best work? And the answer is, we give them to each other. This conference has probably already inspired some great new ideas, and it will continue to inspire a lot more. But one of the most valuable things that it's going to do, it's going to introduce us to some new people, some new kindred spirits, some people who like the kind of books we do, who write the kind of stories we do. And next week, as you sift through all the business cards that we've been exchanging, you know, this, this conference, you're going to remember one or two people that you met. And you should reach out to them and share your writing deadline with them and ask them to do the same. And strangely, people that we do not know very well tend to be much better deadline keepers for us than our friends and family, right? Because our friends and family have gotten far too accustomed to watching us blow these things, completely <laughs> miss these promises that we say. Now, as a side note, in National Novel Writing Month, one of the tricks that a lot of people use is at the start of the month, if they doubt that they're going to go the distance, they write a check to an organization that they really disdain. <laughs> yeah, and they put some zeros on that. I've seen this happen. They then put that in an envelope, address it, stamp it, and they give it to the friend. And the friend's job, unless you show up at the end of the month with a 50,000 word manuscript, it just drop that thing in the mail. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. People also wager chocolate, firstborn children, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. And I think ultimately we have to be as creative with our deadlines as we are with our books because if we are not, these things are going to constantly slip down to the bottom of our to-do lists. Which brings me to the second thing. Momentum. All right. So Isaac Newton, in 1687, accidentally wrote this amazing book for writers. It was not at all about writing. It was about physics. The book was called The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. You guys are like, oh, yeah, I love that book. Love, <laughs> love Isaac Newton. Anyway, so this book contains these two natural laws that we all remember from middle school science class. The first one is objects in motion tend to stay in motion. That's corollary is objects at rest tend to stay at rest. So from watching so many of my novel revisions remain so peacefully at rest <laughs> over the last decade, I can test to the fact that Isaac was really on to something here. Um, and if you're anything like me, even when you have that deadline, that sometimes projects just stall out. You know, and usually this happens when we've had a day or two in a row of kind of tough writing, when things aren't going very well, we sort of lost the thread. And it leaves us feeling kind of blah about our stories, or books, or... And then real life has a way of sweeping in, taking over. And before we know it, a week, or two weeks, or a month, or two months has passed, and we haven't cracked open that writing project. And to return to Mr. Newton, once your book does achieve a state of rest, it is kind of hard to get that thing moving again. And some of you might have signed up for this conference as a way to kind of jumpstart one of these projects of yours that has stalled out. And I think conferences and classes are a great kick in the pants for these things. But the thing about conferences and classes is that they always end, and then we're alone there again with this kind of half-finished project and this big looming question of how does anybody ever finish one of these things. Now the great thing about writing is that small steps taken several days in a row have a way of turning into very big strides. And there's kind of a magic to this, but there's also this growing scientific body of work on the brain that says that when, if there's something that you really want to do, that willpower and discipline actually are very much like a muscle. And that by setting these little goals 
in nailing them, they could be the tiniest imaginable goals. I have a friend whose goal is not to write every day, but to simply open her document every day. <laughs> and it sounds silly, but this woman is actually one of the most productive novelists I know. She writes two books a year and has a full-time job. And it's really not about speed. It, it, it's about momentum. And I think that when we know that really we can go from having something that feels like it has no motion at all, that's kind of dead in the water, to having something that's kind of rolling again just by taking these small steps, it really does change the way we see these projects. So objects in motion stay in motion. The third is an appreciation of messes. Mm -hmm. You can see, if you want to see my place setting, you can see that I have a deep appreciation of messes. Uh, I think I spread a lot of those greens all over that area, <laughs> happily. Um, but I think a writer's job, especially at this point in our careers, is really just to make as many messes as possible. There are the messes that we make on the craft level. You know, the, we have to embrace the fact that our first drafts are really going to be this kind of unholy nightmare of, you know, kind of grammatical car crashes, um, misguided tangents, flat dialogue, one-dimensional characters, cliched plots, and then there's the messes on the business level. You know, where we're, we need to be experimenting, sometimes successfully, you know, sometimes less successfully, um, in doing things like building our platforms, and leveraging social media, and wooing an agent, and trying to stay on top of all of these changing technologies in the publishing industry. And it means that whether we're writing or trying to get our writing out there, we're constantly grappling with these moments where we feel like we're just not doing it right. That we're just sort of fumbling blindly in the dark. And I think that's really what it means to be a writer in the best possible sense. That we get to spend our days in these worlds that we do not fully understand. Trying to make sense of them, both on and off the page. And if we're really, truly giving over ourselves to this pursuit of making writing more of a central part of our life, we're going to have to embrace this fact that we're going to make mistakes and we have to forgive ourselves for it. Because if we're making mistakes, we are learning things. And by trying and failing, we are growing leaps and bounds as writers. And it does not feel like it's happening. But it is happening. And that brings me to my very last of these four carry-on items, which is faith. And this is the hardest of all of them. And it's why I saved this one for last. Faith. I mean, we need a big, old trunk full of faith. We need faith that our books do not suck on some monstrous level. <laughs> you know, we need faith that we are getting better over time. And we need faith that our projects will eventually matter to someone. And as writers, we're observers, and we've observed that it's hard to make a living writing. You know, we realize that this dream of being a writer is an impractical, maybe impossible one. But I will tell you, as somebody who has watched hundreds of thousands of kids, teens, and adults write a book that they never dreamed they would write, that the world holds a lot of great surprises. And that success is often a lot closer than we know. The biggest lesson that I think I've learned from my time running National Novel Writing Month was that everyone, I mean everyone, has so much more in them than they realize. And that when we make the time, and when we give ourselves permission to follow our inspirations and our impractical dreams, that we have power to do unimaginably great things. Things that will change our readers' lives and things that will change the world in the bargain. Now, 
Keeping the faith, though, as your ship is sailing out into these uncharted waters is hard. And I struggle with it as much as anybody else. And this is why I tend to outsource the job to family and friends. I'm not always great at believing in myself. So I let them believe in me. And I borrow their confidence when the going gets tough. And I know that uh, we just met like 20 minutes ago, two hours ago. But I hope that for today, that you will let me carry your faith for you. And that you will believe me when I tell you that your story is important and that your voice matters, and that there is someone out there who has been waiting their entire life to read the book you are writing right now. And when they finally get their hands on it, and they will get their hands on it, they're going to treasure all of the time and care that you have been putting into it. Those readers are ready. Let's go give them something amazing.